Good morning. Um, so just because I'm no longer this year part of the seminar group, so you don't see me every week sitting in the audience, my name is Anthony Caradana. I'm a professor here in architecture, teaching in history, and in fourth and second year design. I'm also a Pratt alumni, alumnus. Um, anyway, so I uh, give the lectures on ancient Rome and on the Renaissance and other things when asked to do so. Um, so today we're starting with this segue from Greek architecture and culture, which I believe Donald may have handed off last week or the week before, and this uh, exploration of uh, architectural history, mostly around the Mediterranean basin. What you see in front of you, well, today we'll be looking at the Etruscans and the Romans, because in fact the Romans were Etruscans. A lot of people don't know that because history tends to highlight the most the most uh, obvious and the sort of memorable aspects of the more recent culture, but the roots of uh, Roman architecture and culture come from the Etruscan lands, or what's called Etruria, and we'll see where that is. In front of you, you see <clears throat> something that's emblematic of this kind of culture and its development and the relationship of the Etruscans to the Mediterranean world and to the Romans. We see the fifth century BC, which uh, means like the late 400s BCE, before the Common Era. And it's called the Capitoline Etruscan She-Wolf because it was located and found on the Roman Capitoline Hill. But it actually originates in Etruria and lands further north. And it's much older than Rome. And it's emblematic of what, well, in the Etrusc it's a symbol of the Etruscan um, culture, but also the sculpture itself, which is a hollow cast bronze sculpture, which the Etruscans were very good at. There are different versions of the sculpture in this image. Uh, originates there and then at the, in the Etruscan era. And below we see a kind of renaissance, you know, almost more than a thousand years later, uh, addition of Romulus and Remus, the legendary twin brothers, the one on the right who is the legendary founder of Rome, and we'll talk about that briefly later. And uh, the story goes that, you know, Romulus was found by a she-wolf and and they were suckled to health, and the, this, you know, the, the, the lesson of being part wolf and part human through this milk made him the great leader of the first settlement at Rome. So much for legend. Oops, the arrows, okay. So uh, geographically speaking, uh, we see Italy here, the, the boot, the famous boot of Italy. Rome is somewhere in the middle, and Etruria is just north, south of where it says Pisa. And we can see this Mediterranean basin that we've been looking at. You've looked at Egypt, you've looked at Greece and its relationship to what is today Turkey. <clears throat> and uh, I believe you might have looked at uh, Iran a little bit. Uh, and so we see how all of these cultures, which at one time or another su uh, succeed each other in being sort of either the trade or power centers of this culture or these groups of cultures that settled and moved because of trade and settled and moved just because of opportunity. Uh, and Italy is strategically placed almost at center there, so is Greece. And so this Greco-Roman culture that we're looking at, which is extremely important and influential on our own American culture and American architecture, is why we focus on this and pay specific attention. And hopefully you will remember and retain this excessive cultural history as part of your own education and understanding of architecture and go back to it and use it when necessary and often. So getting more, getting more close and zooming in, we see the land of Etruria is actually, on the uh, map on the right, is bounded by the Arno River to the north and the Tiber River, which to the east and south, which actually leads directly to Rome. And so, so geographically kind of makes sense, this proximity. But there's something very important about those two rivers and the ocean that bound it, is that it's a very fertile area, fertile in both in agriculture, but also in minerals, and in other ores and precious mineral, uh, precious stones and precious metals. Um, so that's the area where the Etruscans were. They, they, could, they sort of spread out a little bit, but they concentrated mostly in this area that we know today as Tuscan and northern Lazio. So going back, you know, who were the Etruscans? Where did they come from? Um, there were different sort of early mm -hmm. pre-Iron Age and Iron Age peoples like the Celts, which we know a lot about, and again, America also has a lot of Celtic uh, historic and cultural connection uh, through our different European uh, immigration periods. Uh, and the Villanovans, who people don't know a lot about, it's a larger group that migrated and settled in different areas. We'll look at the map in a second and see why that's important. 
And the Etruscans seem to have settled in central Italy somewhere between, the, we say the 7th century, but between the 8th century and the 6th century BC, which was their, the high point of their culture and their power, and then they began to decline. Uh, they existed like many, very, very much like the Greeks, and they were similar to the Greeks in many ways, and they because they coexisted with the Greeks, and Greek culture was dominant at the time, and Greek colonization, we'll see, uh, spread very, uh, and very sort of fully into southern and central Italy and actually up into France. Um, but they existed as a series of federated city-states, just like the Greek cities, right? They were independent cities, but they shared culture, they shared values, they shared sort of legal and political and social systems. And so that's what bound, bound them together, what binded them together. Um, but they were really separate and independent and sometimes at war with each other, very much like the Greek city-states. So. They weren't quite a united culture. They were kind of groups of people that sort of had semi-independence and interdependence with each other from about the eighth to the third century BC. Uh, so the way that they lived, and before the, before the Romans came, most, most uh, Mediterranean civilizations, uh, especially the, the Greeks and the Etruscans, settled in an urban safe place, right? They usually settled on high ground or on a mount and wall themselves into a citadel or a fortified city to protect themselves from outsiders and to have a good outlook to see when the enemy might be coming. Uh, and, um, and yeah, so, so the Mediterranean culture existed on hilltops a lot, right? That was a hilltop urban culture and they used the lands around them to obviously to cultivate and to uh, uh, create a store uh, storage and resources for both eating and for trade. Okay, so the city-state was really as kind of model, and that's kind of the first architectural image you should have in mind, and the relationship of the city to the landscape is very much like that, and the Romans begin that way too again, because they're also descendants and Etruscans themselves. Um, and the, the, the Etruscans themselves were always so, sort of having to defend themselves not only against each other sometimes, but against the Romans in the south later on, in the era of their decline, and from the Gauls always, right? The Gauls were coming from the north. In fact, the Romans were also fighting the Gauls frequently in the early Republic. <clears throat> Eventually, there was a sort of a weakening of uh, the sort of political and military and uh, sort of uh, cross-cultural um, influence that they had, and the decline or, or happened around uh, 500 BCE, or a little bit later, and the Romans then took over and systematically uh, conquered the Etruscans and absorbed them into their culture. So that's why they're very important. In fact, the Romans were part of the uh, Etruscan Federation uh, and actually ruled for, for a very long time by the Tarquins, which were an Etruscan family or a dynasty of, of uh, descendants of family. And the, the, we'll see that the descendants from the, um, in the Etruscan lineage uh, relied very much on the female side, on the daughters, but was a, was a, was a uh, male-centered uh, ruling class. Okay, so what is this Villanovan culture that I just mentioned? It's this culture from, through which it's important to us and for archaeologists to understand uh, where, the, where the Etruscans got their ideas, what kind of cultures, cultural and uh, cultural rituals and cultural ideas and cultural artifacts that they could give us evidence about where they're from and how they helped to formulate who they were and how they also contributed to the Romans. And we see these uh, two sets of slides on top and the bottom. The Villanovans used the way they buried their dead and a lot of the evidence will come from in this culture from cemeteries, from artifacts left over that are buried because the Romans basically destroyed and overtook everything else. So the evidence of the pure Etruscan is difficult to find. So we look for them in these sort of stored buried places which were not valuable to the Romans. And so the way that they used to uh, bury themselves and their uh, burial rites were about uh, cremation and burying the ashes of the dead in urns like these, the ones you see up top. These are the ones that the Villanovans did. And the early Etruscan urns are very similar in shape. They're these kind of stacked cones. The lid of the cone itself of the vessel and the cone that caps it. Also the decorations are quite uh, similar to a lot of Iron Age sort of geometric and spiral and uh, different simple geometric forms. But you see the Etruscan varies slightly. It's a little bit more abstract, a little bit simpler and a little bit later. And we see that area where the Villanova cult Villanovan culture settled. One is exactly in Etruria and the other one is down near Naples. Their language also is a bit different than the European and the uh, 
Latin and the Greek spoken languages of the time. It's a language that seems to come from an area which is today's Turkey, but at the time was called Anatolia. And you see in the larger map that area, which mm -hmm. is Lydia, where this Lemnian language was spoken. It's, an, it's not a Semitic language in that it doesn't come from Phoenician or Hebrew, which is where most of the modern languages and alphabets come from. In fact, the Phoenicians are, alphabet is the one where most of the modern alphabets come from. Uh, so there seem to be different, and we're not sure what this connection is between the Villanovans, the Lemnian language, and other things that we'll see, which are more indicative of how rich the Mediterranean culture was and how there were so many influences, like this one. Well, one of these in in incredible uh, golden plates, which is a commemorative plate around 500 BC in a very important city called Pyrgi, an important Etruscan center. And it's a dedicatory set of plaques, the one on the left, your left, is uh, in Phoenician language. The Phoenicians were a culture that come from today's Syria or Lebanon and the center of Byblos, and I forget the other city, and the sort of coastal, it wasn't much, it wasn't really an empire, it was kind of a coastal culture that had centers along the northern edge of Africa coming down from Syria and Lebanon. They were extremely able navigators, boat builders, sailors, and merchants. And in fact, Tunis becomes their final capital and the Phoenicians become the Tunisians and the Romans become very much uh, in, in, uh, in conflict with them later on and, and also conquer them. But this connection to the Phoenicians and having this sort of uh, like in, the, uh, in Egypt when uh, the Rosetta Stone was found, it was important because the, the three languages that were represented allowed a kind of translation of an unknown language to be translated into a known language. So we have the Phoenician dedication of this temple dedicating uh, and, and asking the god Astrabe to bless this temple which is dedicated to the king who uh, has just passed away. And on the right we see the Etruscan translation. So this is one of the documents, one of the few documents where we can understand how to decode this language. And as we speak that language continues to be decoded more and more, but we still know very little about the origins of uh, the early Etruscans. And, and these are the kinds of records and this is the kind of writing we have. We don't have any literature, we don't have much art other than the art we see, again, in these uh, temple fragments and in these funer funerary architectures and funerary urns and objects. So that's kind of interesting how the Etruscans really come from somewhere else and become sort of the base culture for the Romans. Okay, so the other thing is uh, Greek culture is still very pervasive. Most of southern Italy is called Greater Greece, Magna, Magna Grecia, because Greece being a small country and also not full of resources, the Greeks colonized southern Italy and other places because it was a rich place, free and available land with no uh, more powerful aggressors to sort of uh, uh, to take them over, of course, until the Romans. And they create this interesting uh, weave of culture. And of course, the Etruscans were in contact with them. And we can just see how many of these, um, how much of this commerce and exchange has happened through the types and number of coins that can be found in all of these mm -hmm. Greek settlements and Greek uh, Italian Greek or Italic Greek uh, southern cities. So there's all of this kind of influence and the Greek culture is something that both the Etruscans and the Romans truly admire. It's a highly developed artistic and intellectual and uh, also political culture. So the Etruscan government in many ways reflects some of the, the Greek uh, social structures that you saw a few weeks ago. Again, it's an urban culture. They live in city-states. They rely very much on developing agriculture and using trade, but in, in the Etruscan world, more importantly, it's mining, right? There are a lot of minerals and there are a lot of metals that they use and they also uh, master quite well, as you saw from the first sculpture. So they trade wine, they trade olive oil, they trade, other, they trade seeds, but they say trade a lot of precious metals and a lot of objects that they develop, much like the Greeks. And their cities are modeled on, as I said a few times, on the Greek polis, the city-states. Uh, they're run primarily, as we see, by kings, but kings who are very conservative and also rely on the rich families as a kind of advisory board. It's a kind of monarchy slash oligarchy. Uh, and uh, the wealthy merchant families, uh, how, do, how you become a part of this kind of club of rich families is that in most of these societies is that you have to at least be able to the lowest rung of the ruling class and the advisory class has to be able to afford owning a horse, right? It's the knight class, right? You have enough money to own, maintain, feed, keep a horse, and actually then also be part of the military. Anybody who can't do that is the lesser class or the plebeian or the popular class, and there's always this kind of division and 
uh, a little bit of stress, strife, and conflict between these two classes, uh, as we see even today. Uh, but the class structure in all cases is based on the head of the family, the father, the pater, the fa father of the family, pater familia, and family interest, ancestry. But in the Etruscans, there is also this lineage through the daughter marrying uh, and uh, transferring this wealth to the husband. Right? So uh, in this society, like in Rome, the father has complete power. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the Romans. But women are highly, highly respected. They're almost equals. They actually run the family business. And, and, and we know that also because they're always shown not only equally with the husband on the funerary sarcophagi that you'll see in a while, but also because they're in front and they're highly, much more visible, much more detailed in their dress and their details and in, in their facial expressions. So that prominence is clear from that evidence. Uh, it's also a society like all ancient cultures where slavery is dominant and they use slaves. Slaves really come from people who get conquered uh, through wars or, uh, or, or have uh, violated some kind of uh, social or, or political code and you know, they have to pay their debt by being you know, slaves. Slavery was a bit different in the past because there was a whole slave culture which you, know, you could actually buy yourself out of slavery or win yourself out of slavery and we'll see that also in Roman culture. Now the downfall of Etruscan civilization is exactly what made it interesting and what is that there were a loose federation of city-states that were not, they were not very well organized in a crisis or in a war. Many times, you know, they held grudges against each other, would, would not help each other in wars just because of some kind of uh, perceived offense. And so the thing that united them, which was language and religion and culture, was not enough to keep them uh, intact as a kind of uh, united front against enemies. So they were easily, uh, they could easily um, degenerate or lose their power or be conquered by, uh, by people coming from outside. In this case, we'll see the Romans doing that. Uh, and the ur important urban centers are Turquinia, which is where the Roman rulers get their name, family name from, Veii, Vulci, and Caire, which is actually called Cerveteri today, and Pirgi, which is where that golden, those three golden uh, plaques I showed you are from. And so we'll see now some of the architectural and artistic evidence and language and iconography of the Etruscans. And here we see an Etruscan um, bowl um, on, on your right, which is decorated uh, red on black, which is actually black paint and etched away, reveals the red ceramic below, very much drawn and decorated in very gr high Greek style. We see many Greek urns. And most of what we see in terms of painting, both in Greek and Etruscan art, comes via these urns because they last longer, they're durable, right? They also must have painted elsewhere, but those paintings don't exist because of their lack of in, uh, ability to resist weather and other kinds of uh, wear and tear and destruction. Uh, something that's even more specifically Etruscan is what we see on the left below, Etruscan bukero, uh, which is black ceramic, which is uh, made black by the amount of iron ore that's inside of the clay, so when it's fired, and also in the pigment that's ap applied later and baked on, um, turn, it turns black in the oven like steel does when it's heated up, of, like uh, iron does when it's heated up. Uh, another piece of evidence, which I spoke about just briefly before, are the sarcophagi we see here, which are more, almost life-size here on the right. This is where the you know, bodies were interred as opposed to ashes, and the image of those who are interred in the sarcophagus or this kind of casket, this ceramic casket, are depicted. You can see that they're depicted in quite a positive and maybe happy smiling way. It's not because they're drunk, it's because they believe the afterlife is a good place. Life was a good place, so there's this continuity of the, the good life in the beyond, in this stage of the time that this uh, uh, sarcophagus was made. Later on, we'll see that the sarcophagus is, the sarcophagi look much more unhappy. They can understand that it's the end of their time. They know the Romans either have conquered or will be conquering them, so they don't see much of a bright future beyond their days. So that's, that's a really important distinction if you're an archeologist or an art lover, lover, you can sort of see those two phases in the depiction and the facial expressions of these sculptures as well as in the decoration. On the left, you see uh, what is very much like a Greek koros, although it's kind of got a, a quote unquote livelier or more oriental quote unquote decorative pattern to it. It's sort of uh, the way that the line, the, the sort of linear decoration in the uh, the lines of this on the surface and the facial expressions and the sort of hair ornaments as well as the 
uh, decoration around the tree stump below the sculpture between its legs, right? These kind of volutes, this curvilinear sort of active line has more of a, uh, what, what they say, you know, more oriental phase based on this kind of definition that you might have seen a couple of weeks ago when you had the uh, lecture on the Greek sculpture, this distinction between the phases of Greek sculpture. Uh, it sort of relates to that oriental phase. Those sculptures that you, the sculptures you see on the right usually were placed high up in a building, usually on the top of a temple on the roof. We'll see that in a bit and what that means. And so this map shows you some of, you know, not only the names in Italian now of the, where, the, where the Etruscan capitals were on the, on the uh, map on the right, but also on the left, an interesting map that shows us the distribution of mineral deposits. There were a lot of minerals especially in this area of Etruria, which also, interestingly enough, made it a very high, uh, made, it, made it the electromagnetic field more highly charged than it is today, because most of that ore was mined. Uh, but it's interesting how rich these, this area was in minerals and resources. And therefore, the Etruscans, uh, because of that abundance, became very good at metal smithing, at metal work. We even have these plaques, these uh, stone inscribed incised reliefs that show how a metal workshop worked, the kinds of tools that metalsmiths used near uh, the city of Aquileia, this was found, a blacksmith shop depiction. And this fibula, which looks huge on, huge on the screen, is maybe a little bit bigger than the size of the circle my hand is making here, right? So fibula is actually a pin that holds the cloak closed. You know, they used to use, uh, they didn't wear sleeved or legged clothing. They used togas and sort of uh, veils and draped clothing around them, so to, to pin the, and to drape the clothing, certain metal pins were used. This is a very beautiful decorative one at the height of Etruscan culture, at the height of Etruscan artistry. It's quite beautiful. And we see again the bronze she-wolf, which is a little bit later, and uh, emblem, it's, it's an, sort of an emblem of their craft and artisanship and what they were special at and what, uh, what, uh, one, what one part of their trade was based on. The other part of their trade and their economy was based on, of course, agriculture, and we see typical of the Mediterranean cultures. We all need, we all need food, as they did back then, but the, the area which is Tuscany now is still a, a very fertile landscape, which produces still today wine and olive oil and other uh, food products and vegetables, as they did back then. So that abundance allowed them a sort of wealth, especially the families who own the land. On the right, we see uh, a boundary stone, which not only shows you the boundary between how families marked where their territory and their farms were, but also talks about the family heritage and the battles that they fought and won to retain the rights for this, for this land and all of its uh, resources. Um, so, you know, family pride and, and family economy are very much tied to this activity. And the way that they made money was to transport, this is one of the diagrams of how uh, trade and transportation worked along the Mediterranean, but a lot of Etruscan goods not only went to the west, but also, also, also went back in the other way, towards Greece and the eastern Mediterranean. And the top slides show you how and how that transport happened. It was always on boats. What you see here is a birene because it has two, two oars at the back which are steering uh, mechanisms using both sails and oars. And we see in the cross section and on the right, we also see a physical you know, mock-up of a cross section of what are called amphoras. They're kind of you know, these ceramic containers. They're different forms of amphoras. These amphora probably held liquids, as a, obviously, because it you had two handles and it was a tall vessel to pour the liquids out. It was probably wine, maybe olive oil, probably for wine. And so there was a lot of wine going back and forth and olive oil going back and forth, both for cooking and drinking along the Mediterranean. And that provided an economy for both the Etruscans and other peoples. So now moving to where we get closer to architecture, the one place we can get evidence about how Etruscan architecture looked mm -hmm. is from their cemeteries which were protected because over time, because of flooding and shifting of uh, soil and landscape and because of agriculture, these tombs, which were at one time above the ground, got buried and protected. Uh, this is uh, a cervetteri that we're looking at. And we can see that the, the um, cemeteries were laid out very much like cities. In fact, uh, cities in Latin and were called necropoli, right? The cities of the dead, necro, dead, which is like a Greek term in Paul, it's a city in Greek, right? So the necropolis was always the city of the dead, which was always built outside of the living city walls, and we'll see that a lot in a lot of Greek and Roman cities, and it was laid out in, in, in many times in similar ways. So we see the buildings which seem to mimic or imitate 
what Etruscan houses must have or could have looked like. These dromoi, which are the, you know, the houses for the dead, the house, and the houses for very uh, wealthy families, of course, because you needed money to be able to build and also maintain these large structures. And these large structures were also big enough so that you could bury the family members and allow them to live in similar ways in their city of the dead, in the ways that they did in the city of the living. And we see in the middle slide here that, you know, the cemetery is actually laid out like a city. We see these kind of facades. And here's a detail of the facades, which the cemetery here, because we're sitting in Italy, uh, which sits on a very soft limestone called tufa, the cemetery and these buildings were carved out of the landscape. Um, and uh, uh, the same way that the cemetery is carved out kind of a negative, uh, the, the tufa was also quarried to make building stones for building the city of the living. And so this combination of excavation, creating masonry blocks or stone blocks and, and stacking them, uh, was the technique for making these different structures, very much like the, uh, what is it, the treasury of Atreus that you saw a few weeks ago, built in a kind of a similar way in a small scale, these kind of corbelled or carved interiors that have these conical or dome-shaped roofs and this circular, uh, circular centralized perimeter wall. Uh, in this case, it's also just like the, the treasury of Atreus, it's a dromos, which you come through an opening which is carved as a kind of passageway, you come through a kind of a corbelled arch into sometime a corbelled dome and sometimes a flat uh, excavated space, which I'll show you in a minute. But we see that from this excavation, we get some idea about how Etruscan cities and architecture may have looked like. And it seems to match some of these cinerary urns, right, when they, when they um, cremate their dead. We see a ceramic cinerary urn and a metal cinerary urn, again, two of the artists and crafts that the Etruscans were very good at, and we see what their early huts must have looked like, and they match also what the Dromo looks like, a circular kind of enclosure, which is either made by wood and enclosed by some other material, perhaps uh, some kind of <coughs> skin or fabric, and then protected from the weather. Uh, the, later, the later versions of these must have been made in some kind of more durable material. Uh, this is probably the most uh, unique and interesting tomb, which is the Tumulus of Reliefs. And it's interesting because, again, it's not uh, a vaulted space on the inside. It's actually a carved uh, sculptural leftover, right? Those columns are the stone that was underground, and all of the stone around those columns and the walls was excavated to create this kind of negative space, which seems to look like what an Etruscan house might have been planned like. In the center, we see a sort of lower area, which might have been an atrium space, which might have been open to the sky, like many Mediterranean Greek and Roman houses were laid out. We'll see that next week in next week's lecture. And we see also this kind of relief sculpture on these piers or columns, which seem to hold up a roof. And we see the niches with pillows carved in stone where the dead were buried and laid to sleep and rest in the afterlife. And we see also in the reliefs all of the kinds of tools, emblems, um, decorative and useful objects that were part of life and probably were also hung on the walls in the same way that they seem to be hum, hung and carved in relief in the stone on this sculptural um, decoration of the columns. Uh, so for at the, at the, uh, this idea of death was not something that the Etruscans were afraid of. In fact, they celebrated death, they had, death, they had these wonderful celebrations when somebody died. There were these honorific processions and parades that led to the family's home of the deceased uh, before, you know, after the interment, after the bodies were buried, and people had these grand parties. And you can see in both the relief above and the, the sort of illustration below that they ate and partied the same way as the Greeks and then later the Romans did. The Greeks and Romans all ate around a triclinium. They had these three couches and people laid on their side when they ate. I don't know how they, how they digested when they were eating. It seems very uncomfortable but this seemed to be a very comfortable and pleasurable way to eat, to lie down on your side. And of course they had servants who would bring food to the center on this table around which the triclinum was organized and they would eat and drink from that table. In this case, you also see that there's a lot of parting going on. There's a flutist playing up in the, in the, in the right there. So it was a very happy, positive, celebratory transition that later on it becomes a little bit more doom and gloom. So what was Etruscan religion and cosmology about? How did they see the world? What was their worldview? We see that, luckily, uh, the Romans found this extremely important so that they not only um, retained it, but they also celebrated it and 
the, one of the important parts of Etruscan culture that the Romans venerated was this uh, religious uh, set of practices that was practiced by the Harispex, which was the lead priest or the kind of shaman and the sort of religious leader uh, of the um, Etruscans. So we know a lot about it. There's a, 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 there is a document called the Disciplina Etrusca, which documents all of this, uh, the activities and the rituals and rites of the Harispex specifically. Uh, and, it's, and much more about their sort of pantheon of gods. And again, what we find is that there's a lot of sort of similarity between Greek uh, religion and uh, mythology and Etruscan, but the Etruscans also have their own kind of version of it. Interestingly enough, they're all based on this kind of reading of the, the world as a kind of quadrant four, four corners or quadrant uh, geo, uh, geomancy and geotheology. Uh, so there are preferable sides, just like we saw in Chinese architecture, just like you saw in, uh, the, the, in Indian architecture. The compass is important because it helps to orient zones of uh, importance, zones of symbolism, based on survival, right? Then it becomes something that's venerated and raised to the level of the sacred. Uh, so what they have is 16 gods, which are sort of divided four, four per quadrant. But what's really unique about the Etruscans is that they really were afraid. They were very superstitious. Their religion was based, and they were not very scientific, they were sort of pseudoscientific. They believed a lot in um, superstition and in reading the future, and, and, uh, and that's where they found the, their messages from the gods who told them about how they should live their lives. And so they very much looked at the sky and looked at lightning, especially. They had like 16 lightning gods or maybe more. We're not sure that we keep finding out more. Uh, and there were kinds of warnings they would receive from these kinds of lightnings. Some of them were warnings, some of them were warnings against fear of devastation or just fear of something bad happening to you. There was a whole categorization of these superstitions and fears and how they could read certain, um, um, you know, they, instead of reading the weather, they were sort of reading their, their potential uh, fate. And we'll talk a little bit about that more. And we can see that if we look at the comparison of Etruscan gods and Roman Italic gods, they all sort of seem to match, in many, in many cases, the Greek pantheon. Um, but again, what's, and in fact, they also, they also share and uh, believe in some of these connections like we saw in the inscription of the gold tablets, uh, the, the god Astarte is a very important Phoenician god that they also venerate. And uh, how do they practice their religion? So this kind of uh, superstitious warding off and planning and also uh, being able to read the future, this kind of science of being able to anticipate good and bad through reading of certain signs and certain energies in the landscape and in nature, it finds itself in three sort of practices. And on the right, you can see the person, what a Harispex looks like, very respected person. The fresco on the upper right, you can see that one of the methods for reading signs is to look at bird flight. It's called fulguratoria. Oh, the, sorry, that's, the, sorry, that's the wrong one. It's augury, right? To read how bird patterns are, like migra migration patterns or bird swarming patterns can be read and interpreted by the Harispex and give us certain indications of a bad or good future. The other one we mentioned, which is meteorology, fulguratoria, which is looking at light, lightning. And the third one is this kind of looking at animal parts, looking at animal entrails or looking at animals' insides. Uh, in this case, the Etruscans seem to uh, follow a kind of lineage which is about 1,200 years or 1,600 years earlier than they are from Babylon, looking at animal livers, right? Uh, there's what we see on the right, these sort of stone uh, depictions of animal livers, livers which are used as divinatory uh, tools. And this is the Etruscan metal version of their divinatory tool, which is both a model of and a more abstracted version of, a animal, of an animal liver. But also these markings are kind of a map or almost an urban kind of landscape that they could read and understand the zones of, of, uh, of positive and negative forces in the, in, the, in the animal's liver, so they map an animal liver to figure out the future, or a sheep's liver. Very interesting, it becomes a kind of template, uh, something to, uh, uh, an element to sort of contemplate and see the world. It's kind of model of the sort of uh, emotional and superstitious forces of the world. <clears throat> but what's really more important to us as architects is less that and more how this kind of uh, set of rituals relates to architecture, and it's in the building foundation rights and the city foundation rights. Uh, because the Romans actually keep using this uh, as their own foundation process. So 
in order to, basically what are they doing? In simple form, they're trying to align the extraterrestrial and the celestial forces so that there's a matching order and that the world is aligned with the greater order of the universe, right? That's basically what they do and what a lot, a lot of these ancient cultures that we looked at do that sort of build and create cities, right? They want their cities to match the perfect order of the universe. So what they do basically before they found a building is uh, to sort of mimic or replicate or to reenact the myth of how Tages, which was uh, the important agricultural god and it's kind of one of the most important gods of the Etruscan pantheon, uh, how he how he was came how he was forged and how he forged then the culture around him, which was from a plow, right? And so it's a farmer's culture. So what they do first is they look at the sky for signs, right? They look for this this templum, this kind of map of what the order of the universe is. It's usually a, a compass form. Uh, they wait around for some kind of um, sign, either meteorological sign or an animal sign. Like if an eagle falls on your sight, oh, it could either be really good or really bad omen. That's the place where you should build mm -hmm. your building. Once that happens, there's about five or six phases, they draw this templum that they find in the sky, this compass. Then they contemplate and wait for that sign. Then they um, make sure that they protect the sacred ground by certain rituals. Then they mark and create this template on the ground and, and subdivide the, the, the site into four quadrants in the center. And at the center, they bury these chipus, chipus, chipi, or, or a chipus. A chipus is a marker. We'll see that these markers are land markers. They measure the land. They measure the center, the edges, and the distances between cities. Um, and they establish with this, this device, the groma, sort of ritualizing to say, okay, this is the marker. We're measuring it. We're, we're marking it. We're taking measurements. This is where north, south, east, and west are. And then they cut, cut around the edge. They create a kind of furrow, like they're plowing the land to make this sacred cut to dig into the land to found the building, to make the foundation. Uh, and then this establishes either the boundary of the city or the boundary of the building, and then they start building. Okay, very, very sort of uh, detailed, very, uh, very important. And this should be the way that every building in, uh, should be marked and planted on, the, on uh, uh, sacred ground. It's interesting because something happened with Julius Caesar later on, right? When Julius Caesar rebuilt the Senate, he turned the building so it faced his own uh, family's uh, plaza or sacred or, or uh, temple and sort of sacred ground in the forum, and the Senate hated that because he violated the sacred order, right? He made up his own order. He, well, how dare you do that? The gods are going to be mad at us, right? So this alignment is very important all the way through the Romans. Okay, and then of course, <laughs> urban design and cities are laid out in the same way, are laid out in this north, south, east, west, what the, the Romans would later call Cardo Decumanus, right? The Cardo is north, south, Decumanus is east, west. Cardo actually means hinge, the hinge that the, hinge that the universe rotates around. And so we can see that Etruscan cities were very much built up high, like Greek cities, made of these large blocks of stone to create a wall, and then laid out their, or their city settlement as a very organized grid. The dominant axis is usually north-south, but many times it can also be east-west depending on the landscape, what, what the east-west is leading towards. And we can see that the east-west major streets are very wide, and the northwest secondary streets are how the city plots and the family areas are laid out, and the small pedestrian streets are laid out inside this kind of um, topographically uh, derived edge, in, in that you know, the edge of the town is following the edge of the outcropping of the stone that it sits on. And so that's how we understand better some of the Etruscan cities. And we still have, like in cities on the right, like Perugia, we see a very important thing that the Romans will inherit and take high advantage of and, be, and will become what their architecture is mostly made of, the, the, the Vassur arch, right? It's this semicircular arch, not the corbel arch, where the top arc, the top stone of these segmented wedge-shaped stones, right? That's why it's called a Vassur, the French word of wedge. Uh, comes from this word boisseur, uh, they push against each other. So the, the weight of the, the stone, the weight of the stone itself, pushes against each other in compression. It's a compression force. We'll talk about the arch and how it works in a little while. But this semicircular arch, which was not invented by the Etruscans, but the boisseur architecture seems to be invented by the Etruscans. Other cultures use the arch, but not in, not in this specific technique in detail. We'll talk about that in a minute also. And they used it primarily first to create an aqueduct system. They were farmers, they figured out a way, they were very good hydro engineers, they found a way 
like some other cultures, to move water from where it was to where it was needed, right? To the cities, to the farmland, <laughs> to irrigate their landscapes more regularly and not have to wait for rain so they could systematically and continuously predict a prosperous future through agriculture and the use and movement of water. And so the arch became important in other ways, also to become the gates, uh, the openings over large spans, including the gates of the city. This is a existing Etruscan wall with a reconstructed Etruscan arch during the Roman era in the city of Perugia, with some reconstructions by Augustus of those Etruscan details. And the last piece of Etruscan architecture, which is probably the most indicative and the one that we know most about, is the Etruscan temple, which is similar to the Greek temple, but extremely different. We'll look at the comparison of Greek, Roman, and, and, uh, and uh, Etruscan temples in a later slide. This is what a typical Etruscan temple looked like. It seems Greek, but again, a little bit orientalized in its details and its proportions. What makes it different is that it has a more shallow, but very heavy and very big roof whose eaves project way beyond the interior space below it. That is because of the way it was built. Uh, it's built out of stone and out of tufa, which uh, is soft and also uh, doesn't resist water very, it's not a hard stone, so water penetrates it. So what we see is it's got a base made of stone. The building itself is made of wooden columns in this case, painted wooden columns, wooden beams and wooden, <coughs> and, um, wooden gable beams. Uh, and cross beams, and it's covered by terracotta roof, which is waterproof, so that it can shed the water away from this uh, stuccoed and wood uh, frame and protect it from rotting. Uh, but it also protects it from lightning, right? So the, the terracotta is a kind of is a mediating material from the wood. The wood burns very easily if it's struck by lightning, and of course, they probably had good reason to be afraid of lightning, because in, in the ancient world, lightning destroys a lot of buildings. Buildings made of wood easily go on fire faster than a match, and many cities burned down that way. In fact, Chicago burned down that way, right? So fire, was, fire and lightning were very, very, uh, you know, there the, the was something to be feared and to be protected against. And here we see those koros materials, so you get a scale from the doorway and from the, 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 the life-size sculptures, how big this temple was, it was huge. What's unique about it is that it's a, it's a triple cella um, a temple, which has a space for the three important gods. It has one central frontal approach, a stair which takes you to the upper level or the tabularum of the, of the, the, the base of the temple. And it has these two bays, uh, two layers of bays that take you and are protected sort of porch that, that protect you and take you as a kind of a transitional space to the temple. But it's frontal, right? It's not a te temple in the round like Greek temples are. You can walk around the, and ambulate mm -hmm. around the colonnade and the porch of a Greek temple. Roman and Etruscan temples are frontal. The front is important. You enter from the front and you leave from the front. There's nothing at the back. There is no rear facade. As you can see from the side facade, the front is the important area, right? And entering into the chamber and the interior becomes important, not the exterior. In Greek architecture, it's slightly different. The outside is much more important. In this case, the interior space and accessing the interior space become important. So uh, on the right, we see the list of elements that I already mentioned. The one that I missed talking about is the doorway also is a little different because the bottom of the doorway is a little wider. It's truncated and tighter at the top. And again, it has what we call a little bit of this kind of floral uh, and lively line of, that's closer to oriental art than it is to uh, occidental art. So that's important. This is, we definitely know what an Etruscan temple looked like and that's a great model of it. Uh, the end of the Etruscans, the downfall of the Etruscans was because of two things. One, they were, they were a weak, and weakly united, and so uh, there was a, a very important battle down in Sicily and Syracuse where the um, naval forces of Etruria, who had before mm -hmm. held sway over Syracuse, uh, were, were defeated, and so their prestige and their perceived power had weakened, which opened uh, more confidence in their aggressors. Both the Gauls and the Romans attacked them systematically, and then little by little, the Romans became stronger and stronger. It, they, kicked out their Etruscan uh, monarchy, finally, uh, in the second century BCE, probably by this person who was depicted and who was probably Etruscan himself, but just didn't want to have a king uh, telling him what to do. And in fact, the, the uh, oligarchy were, were probably all Etruscans or uh, uh, adopted Etruscan, wealthy people who became adopted Etruscans uh, as part of the oligarchy. And they decided they wanted to rule themselves. They kicked out the king, and there was no monarchy ever again, uh, uh, at least in, in, 
at least technically speaking, because then there was an emperor later on, but there was no monarch who told everybody what to do. Uh, the, the, Republic, the Roman Republic was born in, in this rebellion, and for many, many years, Rome was a republic ruled by a senate and two consuls. So that's an important demarcation point. We'll talk about that when we look at the history of Roman culture, uh, and that's the end of the Etruscans. And so here, I won't repeat this, just as a study guide, you can see what's important to architecture on the right from the Etruscans, including the urban design, the hydro-engineering and the development of the arch, the foundation rites, the, the description of the importance of both the temple architecture and the cemeteries or necropoli, and the different techniques of metalwork and terracotta sculpture. On the left is some of the important cultural components of the Etruscans, and we can move on. What time is it? Let's talk for about another 10 minutes. 10 minutes and then we'll take a break. Um, okay, so uh, as we see here on this slide, shifting from the Etruscans and the beginning of Roman culture, on the right is a kind of accepted uh, diagram of the different Roman periods of government. So the monarchy, which starts in the sort of understood or at least agreed upon date of the founding of Rome, 1753, which was the time when um, Romulus who was the descendant uh, you can read that paragraph because I'm not going to tell you all the mythology of, of uh, the, the descendancy and heritage of Romulus. Let's just say that Romulus becomes the first king of Rome. He wasn't necessarily an Etruscan. The Etruscans came in later. In fact, the Romans were shepherds, right? They lived on a hilltop. They lived on hilltops. I'll show you in a minute. They weren't farmers. A very different kind of culture. So they probably weren't the people, and we know they weren't the people who invented hydro, the hydroengineering and the archwork that the Etruscans brought in. They had a different set of techniques as shepherds, they lived a different kind of lifestyle. Uh, so this shepherd becomes the first king until the end of the Tarquin dynasty in 509 when the Romans take over and establish a republic from 510 to 27 BCE. And then Augustus becomes the first Roman emperor in 27 BC and the Roman empire lasts till about 476 CE when the barbarians invade Rome and cut off the aqueduct water supply. Here we see a kind of timeline, graphic timeline, of what the Romans were all about. The Romans were all about the conquest of time and space. Uh, they were very interested in life on Earth. They were very pragmatic and organized and very uh, technically uh, um, able people who were interested in literally how to systematize the, the ability to sort of conquer and, and rule not only the land but also the peoples in those lands. And we see from the time of the kings, we see how much land was actually Roman. Remember, the Etruscans were up here. The actual Roman Republic was very small at, at the time of the, at the early kings and, the, and then the later Etruscans. And then the expanse of that small city and city-state of Rome as it took over the peninsula of what we call today Italy. And then by the time of the Punic Wars, here's Carthage where the Punic, uh, you know, the Punic Wars were between the Carthaginians in Tunis and the Romans for the power over the Mediterranean. The, again, being descendants of the Phoenicians, the Tunisians were very good at, uh, at, at moving around the, the, the Mediterranean. They actually conquered all the coastlines that the, the, the Phoenicians had established as kind of ports. <clears throat> and then the Romans fought them and, and beat them and, and basically became the dominant power, the dominant military power of the Mediterranean. And by the time of the Punic Wars, this is how much land the Romans had conquered. And at the time of Julius Caesar during the Republic, which is just before the beginning of, of the Roman Empire, when the first Emperor Augustus, uh, self-proclaimed Emperor of, of the Roman Empire, came along, uh, the whole, almost the whole uh, Mediterranean rim was Roman. Uh, by the time we get to Trajan, who was uh, at the end of Trajan's uh, reign, it was when uh, uh, Hadrian takes over as the next Emperor who builds the Pantheon, which we'll see later. Uh, this is the largest uh, area of conquest, and Trajan was probably the most successful both conqueror and ruler in the late Roman Empire. It never gets any bigger than that. In fact, after that, the Roman Empire starts to deflate. Uh, that's kind of the apex of the conquest of Roman lands. And we can see that northern Africa, parts of the Middle East, what we call the Middle East today, and northern Europe are all Romanized. Right? And we can see the heritage of that as we walk around these places and as we look at our architectural history lectures, we see the sort of uh, the evidence of that heritage as well as the cultural um, echo in different aspects of these different cultures uh, if we study them more closely. Uh, <coughs> so 
What we see is the transformation of this small little city-state to a republic and then to a military and naval power and political power. And this is really important because it really changes everything. It changes the social structure. It requires the invention of and the distribution and establishment of a very organized institutional, political, and economic, and as well as artistic system that unifies all of these different areas under one sort of uh, rule, language, and set of, set of terms. Uh, and that also creates a huge set of important needs and functions as well as, so therefore we need different structures, we need different building types to serve all of these different areas and to keep them sort of in, under one system. Uh, and architecture, the Romans actually used architecture and engineering to do much of this. Uh, okay, so the origins of Rome, very briefly, we see in these early maps, this is a very early map around the time perhaps of Romulus, we see that this little diagram shows us the Tiber River and the only island along that river called the Tiber Island, which you see in the slide here. And this slide is taken from about here. Uh, it's only taken about five or six years ago by myself. And we can see that being this kind of hilltop and valley geography, it's susceptible to flooding a lot. Water coming down from the upper regions, from the mountains, can make the, the, the Tiber rise about 20 to 30 feet. And so in the ancient world, before what we see here today, there's a wall that separates the river, built in the 1800s, separates the river from the city. The city used to flood everywhere. In fact, the valleys between the hills would be flooded and become small river tributaries. There was actually a lake here, which is today where the Colosseum stands. We'll talk about that later also. So the culture there was, of course, you had to live on the hilltops and therefore they were shepherds. They, the one way they could live was by animal husbandry, so they raised sheep and other animals and lived off of that and they sort of went up and down the mountains whenever the water would recede. Eventually, when the Etruscans came in, they, they brought in some systems of water management. We'll talk about that later. And the first gated, the, the first walled city of Rome which was on the Palatine Hill where the house of Romulus supposedly stands today and where all the Roman emperors lived after that on the Palatine. And we see then later the wall, of one of the first walls of Rome, the Servian Wall, was built to protect it from invaders. Okay, so Roman government and Roman law. The Romans were interesting because law was very important. In fact, American law is very much based on Roman law. They had a very clear and defined and very well-established uh, legal system that allowed them to create a contract. The contract was very important, but they, even in the United States, they, the legal contract is a very important way to do business, not just in business, but in any interaction between individuals or institutions or groups of people. And they were very uh, clear and systematic about how, how they used that to govern their lands and govern people very far away from Rome that they were conquering and who would have to um, um, agree to agree to the Roman law. Uh, again, before, you know, going through this, we go from this period of kings and an advisory board to the Republic, which lasts about 450 years, where, you know, each person who was a wealthy oligarch, half of the year they were farmers, and they would farm their land and do business. The other half of the year, they were required to be the military, right? They were, they were the people rich enough to own a horse, to commission or make weapons, and to protect their own lands. And so all through the Republic, we see that the Romans are fighting for this, them, themselves. Later on, and, and in fact, Roman citizenship is given to everybody who is a patrician. The plebeians, the poor people, are not considered Roman citizens. They're considered Roman subjects because they don't own anything, and thus the sort of social tension. Um, and the patricians were always the, the, the landed wealthy families, people who were part of the families who owned land and the people who owned the land. And they were very conservative, conservative and traditional because, they, of course, they wanted to protect what they had and didn't want to share it with anybody if they didn't have to. Um, <clears throat> but they then later on allowed the plebeians to sort of have a vote in the, in the Senate that they, that they ran as a kind of ruling body, led by two councils, which would switch every year. They'd, they'd vote in two more councils, who basically would be people who were the head organizers, not necessarily the rulers. They were given the responsibility, you know, like an administrator, to make sure that everything ran smoothly. And then next, the next year, new, two new councils would be elected. And again, the pater familias is, uh, familias is a kind of cultural family structure that allowed the father to be the head of the family and could, you know, the father was the last word. If your son or your daughter or your slave did anything wrong, 
you had absolute right to do anything to them, to punish them, to teach them a lesson, including kill, kill them if they, had, uh, if they disobeyed you. So the father was very powerful, and this figure of the father of the family was very powerful. They owned everything, including their family, as well as property, and slaves. Slavery was absolutely essential, especially in the Roman Republic for this kind of, uh, let's call it free labor, for slaves, there was a slave culture and a sort of hierarchy, <laughs> but the sort of positive side of being a slave that you could win or buy yourself out of free, out of slavery, and in fact, many freed slaves became leaders of the, many parts of the, the Roman administration and government. Many of them were the right-hand people to the emperors and did most of the work and administrative sort of hard stuff when the emperors were out doing, uh, you know, their own thing, whether it was socially or uh, politically. Uh, freed, freed men later on became very important um, members of the political system. Um, <clears throat> so the Romans also at this time, during the Republic, before they get to uh, the Empire, which was much more a sta stable sort of phase in their uh, conquest of, of Europe and, and the Mediterranean, uh, they didn't really have time to focus on the beautiful things, right? They were always at war with each other. There were a lot of internal power str struggles between the families, very, very vicious sort of um, <clears throat> fighting uh, to, to, to gain control. There was still a lot of war with the people that they were trying to conquer or who were trying to fight against them, like the Gauls, right, uh, mm -hmm. coming from uh, the north <clears throat> and other different tribes. So there was really never time to deal with architecture or the city itself. And urban development came later. So Rome was pretty rustic for a long time, especially during the Republic. It's not until uh, the empire that Rome begins to become what we know of Rome as today, uh, this kind of beautiful capital city, uh, large and very, very metropolitan in its scale. Roman religion. R R Romans were not religious in the way that we think about religion today, perhaps. It wasn't, their sense of religion wasn't introspective. It wasn't metaphysical. They really didn't speculate much about the afterlife. Uh, to them, living today was the most important. They were very materialistic, not very spiritual. Their religion was much more like law. Right? They, were, they were interested in how to set up a relationship with themselves and the world, right? So uh, it was a kind of contract between them and their gods, right? They had these cult practices which ensured two things. Religio, which is where the word religious comes from, to have sort of values, right? Your value is that I value my word. I give you my word and that's very valuable. So they would make a contract with the gods. We give you our word. We will venerate you, we will, we will respect you, we will uh, have rituals that respect you, we will sacrifice animals and later people to you so that you, can, you understand how much we respect you. In return, we want you to leave us alone and not kill us, right? That was the kind of uh, contract they had with the gods. And, sec and secondly, again, which is uh, sort of part and parcel with this uh, respect for vows, they saw loyalty and obligation as being very important, pietas, right? So this was the kind of contract and the way they saw their relationship with the gods. So they had a lot of these kind of uh, pagan and so ritualistic practice, practices which ensured that this stability would happen between them and the sort of metaphysical uh, aspects of their pantheon. And again, this is why they borrowed and used the Harispects and the Etruscan, um, the Etruscan religious practices so that they could ensure and continue this kind of good relationship and good faith uh, with the religious sort of energies of the world. But they, they, they really didn't spend much more time than that un, until later on when they began to absorb religions that came from the, uh, from the peoples that they conquered, right, who later became part of their military. So they adopted some of the Eastern religions. They also were kind of open-minded about religion because they didn't have this kind of sacred, profane value system about religion that other cultures had. So they allowed different kinds of a kind of uh, multiplicity of religions to coexist, including these more pagan rituals, which are personal rituals like the, the household and family gods. Uh, if any of you watch the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Gladiator, with the movie with Russell Crowe, you see that he's carrying around in his pouch all the time these little figurines. Those are the lares and panades of his family. They guard the household perimeter and they guard the kitchen and the hearth of the kitchen, right? The, the center of the house, the interior, the, where the family dwells and eats, and also the walls that protect them. And that's what the sort of the lares and the panades uh, uh, symbolized. So the Romans were very, were very good about that sort of uh, m multi, multi sort of sided re religious inclusion and open mindedness. And again, even they didn't really have any Roman gods. There are really only two gods that today we can say 
are purely Roman, which is Janus, which is the god of portals, right, which guides boundary, boundary lines and thresholds, and Portunus, which is the god of ports, where you pay taxes to get in and out of cities and ports. Right? That's, those were their only indigenous gods, and even that is in question. They might still have some Greek uh, antecedents. So they were happy with borrowing. They were happy to let anybody bring in any kind of uh, ideological or physical imports or resources and make it part of their culture. This is the way they sort of brought a kind of unity to Roman culture also. Okay, so moving to architecture. Funny enough, we can say that Roman architecture begins in the sewer, right? The cloaca maxima was, and the cloaca maxima, and all of these uh, sort of um, early <clears throat> important infrastructural and architectural um, um, examples I'll show you uh, start with Etruscans, right? This might be a good time to stop and give you a break. Okay, welcome back. <clears throat> See how far we get through um, the architectural. So this part of the lecture is going to introduce Roman building practices, so you understand how Romans built. Very important. I think that's probably the primary lesson today, right? How did the Romans build differently than everybody else, and how did that produce a unique architectural set of conditions? One of the big shifts will be how we understand space, which is critical to all of you, since you're architects, and how we define that zone of space that we inhabit and experience and understand through the frame of architecture. It's critical because Roman architects are probably, in the history of architecture, the first interior designers that create a sort of wide range of building types, spatial types, and functional types. Next week we'll look at all of those different kinds of building types that are necessary, needed, required for this complex society, this complex vast empire and all of its functions and requirements and the central role of architecture to provide those solutions. Right? So this rich vocabulary of architectural space is what we'll be looking at and what's significant about Roman architecture not just its building techniques, but what that tool of the construction system, the particular vaulted architecture that they produce, and how it's adaptable and variable to many, many, many functions, needs, and solutions, okay? That's central. That's why we look at Roman architecture, okay? So, again, like I said, it's funny that we start with Roman architecture and we start with the sewer. The Cloaca Maxima, which was the main sewer, and we, when we say sewer, it's really a water management channel. It's not necessarily, you know, full of uh, refuse only. It's really just moving water, moving water from places where we don't want it to places where we would rather have it. So it's moving water from the land back to the river, the river Tiber. <coughs> where was the water originating? Well, the water was in these areas that we looked at here in the spaces between the hills. So the Etruscans, when they came in, they wanted to dry out the valleys so they could use them. So being great hydro engineers, they used their arches and their aqueducts and their sewers to move the water from lower lands and created areas that would become later. I'll show you where they made space. One was the Roman Forum and the other was the Circus Maximus. They cleared the land of water in those areas and created uh, permanently clear, uh, uh, water-protected, waterproofed areas where water would not invade by using these systems. So the arch came first as a kind of uh, engineering element, an infrastructural element that moved water. And we can see here on the right the inside of the Cloaca Maxima, which moves water from basically the Roman Forum and other areas around it to the Tiber River. We see on the left lower slide, looking at the Tiber River, we see an arch to the right of the bridge, underneath the temple behind it. Inside of that arch, where you see the walkway in front of it, is the actual Cloaca Maxima opening, which takes the shape of the arch you see on the right. On the left, you see a kind of diagram of how the Cloaca Maxima works. It's underground. You see the sort of rubble below the street under which the Cloaca Maxima sits, and you see the channel of water. And you see all of those, those sort of square tubes, those kind of drains that drain from the streets and from the areas of the paved uh, spaces that the Etruscans want to leave clear, how they sort of uh, spill into the underground channel. So the aqueducts are either underground or above ground. I should say the aqueducts, which are different than the sewers, aqueducts bring potable water, 
which we'll see later, and the sewers drain brown water or dirty water, right? Not necessarily sewage. So when we look at the section of the cloacamoxia, we see that the middle stone, right, at the top is actually the keystone, which locks everything, right? It locks all of the arches into compression against each other by pushing down and pushing either right or left to hold them in compression. We'll talk about how that's made in a little while. So how does Roman construction work? It starts, it's basically, you need a wall. It starts with the wall. Roman architecture is about the wall and the arch. Remember that. It's not about the column and the beam, which is what Greek architecture is about. It's about the wall and the arch. So how do they build walls? They build thick, strong walls to be able to support the mm -hmm. weight coming from the arch above. We see kind of three eras of wall making. On the left, we see pre-Republican and Republican Roman walls because they were made by a, a stone pattern made of the tufa stone that they could easily get from under the, their feet, under the ground. And uh, so they would make this, uh, these walls basically two-sided. They would build these stone walls and fill them in with rubble, fill them in with material so that the wall could be easily erected quickly. They would build this kind of permanent formwork. The wall was a kind of edge that was a permanent formwork. And the inside was just kind of infill, a kind of soup of rubble and, and mortar and things that would stick together and also work well in compression. Work well so that the weight from above could, would, be, would be supported by the, the material below and become stronger and stronger by pressing vertically through the natural pressure of gravity pushing downward and strengthening through that compression the performance of the wall to stand up straight and to support weight, okay? So on the left we see how the tufa stone exterior is made. What we see also is that the edges, when you, when you get to an end or when you get to an opening, you use a more precise stone block. This block on the left, which is made of tufa, is called opus incertum. It's <laughs> uncertain. It's of different, all different shapes. They're fitted together. It's not very systematic. It's piecemeal and it takes a long time to build. We see during the Republic in the middle, this something called opus reticulatum. They take this square shaped block of tufa, and in all of these cases I'm showing you, if we look at the three-dimensional shape of each stone, it's really like a spike, right? The front is flat and broad, and then it tapers like a tooth root to the back, right? Similar to a cone, right? Like, like, the, uh, like we see in Babylon when they build the ziggurats. They actually make this mud wall, and then they hammer in a fired brick, which is the shape of a cone, like a nail, right? So the tooth at the back allows space for the rubble in, inside the wall and the cavity to grab onto the outer stone, which again is an outer sort of formwork. It's a permanent formwork, right? It makes the shape of the wall and then it gets filled in. So this opus reticulatum, which is made during the Republic, is much more precise, much more systematic. Every stone is the same size. They use a template to cut the stones. So the production of this wall and the production of the construction is a little bit more fluid and fast. We also see in the illustration that there's a mixture in that wall mm -hmm. of the opus reticulatum and to the right in, the, in that um, axonometric we see some brick. So the Romans start to experiment with a more systematic way of making um, masonry units which is to actually make them as opposed to cut them and cast them from nature by actually taking earth, terracotta clay and making fired brick which makes it more fireproof, mm -hmm. which, makes, which, which makes it also easier and faster to produce. By the time of the empire, around Augustus' time, all Roman walls, all Roman buildings are made of brick. This very long, skinny brick we see on the right, which also we see the arch, the piece of the arch below in the right-hand corner. Uh, they're systematically made and run by the empire and also, also authorized by the empire. There are many, many brick factories, brick firing factories, brick making factories, and we'll talk about how they're made later. But if you look at it in the axon, they look like triangles, look like pieces of pizza, right, with a flat edge, right? Because they're actually made from a square stone which had an X cut and drawn from corner to corner so that it could be cracked and made into these sort of triangular pieces, triangular in plan, but flat and quad quadrated and long and thin in elevation. And so, again, very systematic, much easier, much faster to make, much more predictable and uh, very quick to construct. Okay, so this is what a Roman wall looks like in section and in construction. We have a foundation, uh, we have foundation stones, and then we have this outer double edge on either side that then gets filled in with concrete 
We'll talk about concrete in a minute. It's a kind of mortar that has a specific ingredient. You build up the wall. What's also interesting, you see the scaffolding? The wall acts as one side of the scaffolding that workers can build up temporarily to get up to the wall as the wall gets built. And you'll see many times in Roman walls, I don't, you see those holes on the, you see the holes in both cases on the left and right? That's where you would fit in the beams that hold up the other half of the scaffolding that would be the walkway upon which you could then build the next level of the wall. So when you remove the outer edges of whatever's be, whatever is in front of this brick or stone wall, which gets decorated later with marble, right? The brick is never the finish or rarely the finish. Usually there's something applied to the stone to make it look nice. But the actual Roman part, what's really Roman, is this wall and archwork and the holes that hold up the scaffolding. Okay, what is a vault and what is, I'm gonna slow down because you're architects and this is very important. It's very important also from your understanding in your structures classes and a little bit in what you're doing in techniques, although techniques is a little bit more of an intuitive search for you than, uh, than this system, which is very systematic, very related to material and the forces in nature. So what is a vault? What is this voisor vault? Remember, we're talking about a semicircular arch and in Roman architecture, the arch begins as a hole in a wall. It's a wall, and to make a hole in the wall, we have to somehow bridge across the opening along the length of the wall. That's how the arch starts. So the drawings on the top show us a wall, and these arch-shaped top and sort of parallel edges to the opening, which is probably a doorway, or a series of openings next to each other, right, that create more of a screen than an actual wall that's solid that separates. And on the right you see how an arch is made, which helps us to explain how an arch works. So you build the wall from the bottom of the floor or the ground to the top of the straight portion of the vertical edges of the opening. And at the bottom, uh, sorry, at the top of that wall, we begin with a scaffolding. This circular shaped scaffolding allows the workmen to take the separate wedge shaped stone and stack them next to each other, one on top of each other, and so they have something to rest on until that middle stone at the top, which is called the keystone. And the reason why it's called the keystone, because mm -hmm. it's key to the arch, right? Mm -hmm. It locks itself in between all the other wedges. And at that point, the arch is active. All the stones work together and they push against each other. And you can take that wooden frame, that circular wooden scaffolding away, and the arch will remain standing, stable and static unless you try to push it. Right? And then you infill above the arch more and more stone, which gives it more weight, which gives it more compression, and allows all the stone to, e to work even more tightly. If you take your fingers together and you push them like this, that's the action that the arches create. Right? They push against each other and lock together with more and more weight. The more weight that's placed, the more solidly intact the stresses of the arch, or I should say the compression forces of the arch hold it together. It's a really great, simple system. It's like stacking books, but it's stacking books and integrating them through gravity. Important thing is if you put arches together, right, the pier which creates the structure that supports the arches or the series of arches also becomes stronger. But what's interesting is that the weight, and you can see the diagram here, the weight that's above in the wall, the weight of that stone is transferred to the arch and all that weight is directed along the edge of the arch down to the pier and then transferred back to the ground, right? That's how the forces of compression work along the vertical direction, the vertical, then diagonal, and then vertical again direction of the force of the weight from above the arch through the edges of the arch down through the pier into the ground. That's very important for you to understand as architects because the arch explains a lot of things, including a lot of other structures, the reverse of the arch, which is a catenary structure of a suspension bridge, right? You will learn all this stuff in structures. Okay, the Romans take this, and that's not enough. Not only do they make one opening, not only do they make a serial set of openings next to each other and create a colonnade and an arcade, what we see up here is called an arcade, right? And makes a space, set of spaces through the wall and spaces beyond or on either side of the wall. We'll see that in the Horea or the warehouses that the Romans made at the beginning of the Republic in a minute. But what's also important is not just the use of the arch, but it's this invention of something called concrete, okay? Concrete is a mortar 
which mixes water and sand and lime, but adds this other material called pozzolana, which is basically um, uh, sort of ash that comes from volcanic rock and vol volcanic eruptions, which originates in Naples, right, south of Rome. This kind of invention happens in Naples because there are volcanoes there. Right? There's this volcanic ash everywhere. And if you mix these together and then pour this around the rubble, the big chunks of stone that they used to throw in the dirt that they used to throw between the outer permanent formwork of the walls, it sort of dries, tests, and sort of crystallizes into this very hard rock-like man-made or man-made mixture of natural materials and becomes as hard as stone in compression. But it's man-made. You can mix it. It's like a recipe. You can cook it, so to speak, as an architect or as an engineer. Okay, so those two things together, the arch and, its, and the knowledge of the arch and its science and art and the use of concrete make Roman construction extremely easy and fast mm -hmm. to build, extremely durable, and eventually extremely flexible. One very important thing is when you look at this slide, these are not Roman arches. These are Egyptian arches. John will go to this man for showing this. But, you know, it's important to know that the Egyptians and the Greeks knew how to make an arch. They did not make boisseur art arches like the Tuscans. They made sort of a mixture between, they are kind of boisseur, but they're not wedge-shaped stones. They're just clay brick that take the shape of the vault and are made not necessarily with wood stonework. They would fill up the ground with a mound of earth, then put the stone up and then remove the earth without wood, without wood scaffolding. But the Egyptians didn't use that as their, as their sort of symbolic construction system or architectural form. The Egyptians were interested in the pyramid, the obelisk, and other forms, right? And the pylon. And, uh, and, and the whole idea of the axis, right? But they didn't never use it. They used this, this was the underground storage, wheat, uh, the uh, granary or wheat storage chambers for the, for the, for the uh, pharaoh. The Greeks also used them sort of as temporary storage systems. They never used them as, a, they were sort of utilitarian structures. They had no symbolic meaning other than create a vault, right? Literally like a bank vault, not the vault shape, for their very important grain. So other cultures had knowledge of this. Like all the techniques that the Romans used, they didn't really invent things. They took inventions and they capitalized on them very much. They were very good engineers, very inventive, very systematic in evolving the potential of the system and, and sort of making it a kind of institutional tool. So, but the, what the Romans did do is then take the arch and the vault and begin to play with the different ways that it could be combined. And here we start to see the beginning of how the arch becomes the vault, right? But using the vault, so we saw that in the sewer. And then they start to combine the vault in different ways, like crossing the vault, creating cross vaults or groin vaults. The groin being, the groin being that bend between where the two arches intersect at 90 degrees, it creates a diagonal joint, right? Wow, and then there's this big, heavy corner pier, which creates a sort of rectangular space, not just a threshold or a doorway between the two sides of a wall and its opening. And then they begin to combine them, and there's our growing vault here, and then they begin to combine and create different vaults, like umbrella vaults and um, pumpkin vaults, and we'll see some of them as we look at the history of architecture, and different ways of combining all these vaults into different building spaces and building complexes into larger and larger, one, building, programmatic types, but also spatial types, interior spaces that had never existed before in the history of architecture. And they could do that very quickly because they had such a uh, available uh, workforce, slaves and the military. And they also had this system which was easy. It was not a very difficult technique to master. You and I could probably figure out how to make a, an arch and a vault in a weekend and maybe make, maybe make a vaulted space over a week, right? Four or five students and a professor. Very easy, low, tech, low sort of um, technical uh, training. Uh, you probably don't even need to know how to read to build an arch, okay? So, the importance of it was then the way that these vaults made spaces, right? Uh, so this is how you make an arch and the materials that, that they're made from. And concrete is essential. But what does it do? It the, the idea of the vault is that it creates this interesting Interior, interior unobstructed space, unobstructed by intermediary structural elements. Like in this space, you see these columns, right? Those are the only interrupting elements in the clear span of the space. Otherwise, the space goes all the way out to the walls, right? And the roof becomes our kind of wall. This is a very large span, by the way. This is like a, what, 40-foot span or 35-foot span? It's pretty wide. 
Um, so Romans could make wide space, wider than this. The Pantheon is maybe twice as wide as this room. And it has no columns in anywhere between the outer edges and the interior, right? So the idea of making these grand interior spaces that could easily be shaped, built, with no interruption of any kind of materials or other structure, and could define the experience of that space by shaping the actual space. They were making shells. It's a shell architecture, okay, between using masonry and concrete. Very, very interesting. The only thing that came anything close to this at one time was, again, you've seen it, the treasury of Atreus. And it makes you think about how important that interior space and how that space was made, how important that is in the history of space making, not just in architecture, because that's what you all do. You make spaces, right? You don't make objects. You don't make masses, you make space. So these concrete masses um, became a new language. And we can see on the left how some of those combinations, going from the wall and the aqueduct that we'll see in a while, and the vault become the dome, right? This kind of semicircular, semispherical space, hemispherical space that we'll see as kind of the emblem of Roman architecture. And the idea of the curved surface, the curved wall, the curved ceiling, the curved roof, and the continuous sort of formation of the curve because of the sort of flexibility and geometry of the arch and its forces. Okay, so now we can look at some how, how these buildings evolve, building types. Uh, here's a very important building type. You need to store things, and you need to store things safely so that they don't get wet, so that, that fire doesn't get to them, and so that you know, other kinds of things that will, will, will affect or attack your food source and your precious natural materials is a very dry and safe and solid space which won't go on fire. So the Romans first started using uh, this system to, as storage spaces, right? They, they learned how to systematically make huge square footage area shelters like this new, uh, this new set of warehouses which was near the new port of Rome which is a little bit farther south from the center of Rome towards the mouth of the, or sort of the end of the Tiber uh, which was uh, the port down the river where all of the boats would come and bring all the resources from the empire and float it up the Tiber River to this new port, the Porta Amelia, with this huge set of complex complexes of horea or warehouse buildings. And as you can see, they're all arches and vaults. Very interesting. They're, they're arches <coughs> based on the main structural walls, which have openings in them. This kind of arcade, which allows you to move from one wall to the next. They are also vaulted between those walls, and they're systematically repeated and aligned in a very simple and easy building process, and a simple and easy gridded kind of axial distribution. Very flexible, very easy to build, very easy to repeat and continue, and the only thing that interrupts the space are the walls and the openings between them. But you could make those openings larger, you make the sphere smaller, to your, to your specifications and necessities for storage and light. And at the end we see how light came. And you could just make more arches and openings, windows, clear storage, and openings to allow light and access for the cart and the goods. <laughs> so that's basically how Roman buildings work. But Roman buildings were not just arches and vaults, but what made them Roman is the arch and the vault. The Romans also loved love, absolutely, could not get enough of Greek culture, Greek art, Greek architecture. And they looked at the buildings that the Greeks had left in Magna Graecia, down in southern and Middle Italy, and all the other parts of Europe where the Greeks had colonized, including as far north as Marseille, France, which they also conquered. <clears throat> and they said, wow, why can't we do that? Those Greeks here are pretty amazing. So the Greek column, the order, which is actually a sculptural element, it's only structural. Remember, the Greek column is only structural. It only supports kind of the span between itself and the next column, and the porch that surrounds the cella of the Greek temple, and nothing else, right? It just supports the beam and the roof that's supported by the beam in this kind of stone architecture that mimics wood architecture, <coughs> um, this beam and column architecture. And they said, we want some of that. We, remember, at this point, Rome had not, does, does not have a capital city that looks anything like a Greek city would look like. They have no temples that look like Greek temples. So when they see these temples on the land that they conquer in their own peninsula, they begin to find a way to adapt it and, and add it to their architecture, but as an ornament. It's not structural. It's to make the building look important, to make that highly evolved sculptural ornamental architecture full of meaning, full of sort of visual interest and sophistication and style, and apply that as a kind of clothing to their architecture. 
So Roman architecture structurally is a series of arches and vaults mm -hmm. based on a wall and roof shell system with this iconographic sculptural dressing of the Greek orders. Now remember, the Greeks had three basic orders, the Zurich, the Ionic, and the Corinthian. The Romans changed the door by adding the base and making it a little bit more slender and paper. They call that the Tuscan. And then they made two new orders at the end, which are basically a combination of the order, mm -hmm. other orders to sort of apply them to different buildings to give them different symbols based on the way that they're used or what they're dedicated to or to a particular um, sort of iconographical, uh, icono iconographic meaning, whether it's more legislative and perhaps more functional and practical to something that's more sophisticated, important, or urban, like the more tall and slender and ornamented architectural orders at the end. So they had this system of making a visual language mm -hmm. that explained the importance of the use of the building by applying this aesthetic and sculptural coding from Greek architecture. So Roman architecture, again, is a wall architecture using arches, vaults and domes to create a shell, masonry shell, which is both fireproof and waterproof to a certain degree, and applies this decorative system of the Greek orders as its language. That's what Roman architecture is made of. You should remember that because that would probably be an answer on one of your exam questions, right? How is, what is Roman architecture? How is it different from Greek architecture? <clears throat> okay, so how much time do we have left? 20 minutes. 20 minutes, all right. So let's see how many buildings we can get through and then we'll see the rest next week. So the first building we look at, which is actually a building complex, and shows you how the Romans really were very ambitious and very thorough and aggressive in their program of conquering time and space, and that they even could conquer landscape very easily. One of their most impressive early Republican architectures was the, in the city of Praeneste, uh, is this um, landscape architectural infrastructural intervention, which is really a uh, sanctuary. It's a religious and ceremonial place. There is at the top of this, at the bottom is the city, at the top is a religious shrine, right? So here is, this is basically the basilica, we'll talk about the basilica, so this is the temple, and this is the senate house down at the bottom of this hilltop city. This, of course, it's easier to build at the bottom and more difficult to build at the t and to get to the top and build at the top, where this shrine is a kind of well to this, um, this uh, early Greco-Roman god, uh, which is basically a well god, right? It's, it's a spring. Um, <clears throat> at first, they had built walls at the top, which were made of opus and chertum, to dignify and to support and to protect the, the, uh, the sanctuary. But that the later uh, Republican Romans wanted to do something in between. They wanted to create an ascent to this space and create a series of spaces that were important to both mediate and make it easier to get there, but also to create a series of functions and a series of experiences, interior and exterior, that is part of this passage from this kind of profane city life and this very special symbolic place at the top of the mountain. And so they created these seven levels, right? They actually carve into the landscape. And very few of other cultures before, the, since the Egyptians were able to do this, in fact, if you look at the temple of Hatshepsut, it does something similar, but not quite the same, in that it builds an architecture against a cliff and then carves into and builds into the cliff by carving. This, in fact, is building a series of levels, a series of terraces, which are defined on their outer edges by passages, ramps, stairs, <coughs> arcades, and colonnades, that become sort of a series of, of transitions between the bottom city and the space at the top, crowned by a big plaza, this urban space, all organized around a central dynamic axis, finishing up with this kind of amphitheater that faces out of the landscape, very much like a Greek theater does, not like a Roman theater, looking back at that passage and that landscape that they've created and that they've conquered, protecting the shrine above and behind it. What's also interesting about this is this site, when we look at this level here, where we see these two niches, and I forget if it's the left one or the right one, but one of these two is the earliest existing example of concrete vaulting from the Roman Empire, right? It's actually made with uh, harder stone and tufa, and uh, the vaulting, which you can see more in the section, is this coffered vaulting, which we begin to see in many Roman buildings, which begins to make the weight, it sort of makes these pockets in the vault so that it makes the vault lighter, but also gives it kind of modulation, spatially, physically, 
and visually so that the light reflects around it and creates this kind of visual effect, which the Romans are very interested in. We'll talk about that when we get to the Basil of Caracalla. But this is an extremely amazingly ambitious, successful uh, urban landscape architectural planning, which could not have happened without concrete and without the, without the arch and the vault, right? And the Romans, as well as without a huge labor force and, and, uh, and, and the military to make sure that all of this gets, gets done properly. Very organized, and we see all of the elements that we talked about, the, inc the inclusion of Greek architecture and columns, and in this case, they're actually structural also along the edge, at least supporting half of the vault. But this decorative sort of clothing, this revetment that dresses up and gives meaning to the utilitarian arch and vault work behind that support both the excavated spaces and the built spaces in front of them. And it's quite an amazing uh, piece of work. You can actually go there and visit it. Our Rome program takes students to this site. And it's really, you know, behind all of this is a kind of, again, administrative organization. And we look to the military as a kind of example of how, the, how organized they were. In fact, again, the Romans have to, have to also, not, in, in, you know, if it wasn't for the Romans, we probably would have forgotten about the Greeks, you know. Because the Romans took so much from the Greeks, including how they organized themselves in warfare. The difference is that instead of this organization, the Greeks used to fight in an organization called the phalanx, right? And they used to use these very, very long spears, worked as a unit, and would push their enemy as a group like this, holding their spears and holding their shields so nobody could hit them. The Romans took this a step further. When we look at the Roman legion, which is made of, uh, and, and the centuries, you, they're called centuries because it's a group of 100 soldiers with their hierarchy. The, uh, uh, but they use the shield and the gladius. The gladius was what the gladiators used. Hand-to-hand -hand combat was the way that the Romans worked. And they mixed this kind of organization of the group and the individual, the shield and the gladius, and the century and the legion to create a kind of, you know, uh, integrated set of modules, let's say. Each, each soldier was part of that module, and they would rotate systematically to let the soldiers at the front who were doing all the work and fighting shift and let the next group of soldiers behind them move to the front with their fresh energy to protect the group and they used the shields in many ways including in this tortoise formation to guard against arrows to guard against any kind of group of or individual person trying to attack the group they would create a wall and in fact they would create a kind of vault as you can see right it's kind of like a dome yeah even their military was architectural so this ability to organize both groups and activities and elements and materials, we can see in the way they, uh, they uh, organize their military because this is what they used to conquer the lands. They worked in the systematic administrative um, parts to whole system that allowed them to work uh, towards this goal. <clears throat> so that same kind of organization, and we can look at some of the other ways that they organized uh, cities and, and, the, and administrating cities, was the way that they founded cities. Many of the, Roman provinces either started as Roman camps for the military to conquer, or they were veteran communities that gave uh, conquered lands to uh, retired veterans to begin and settle a new Roman settlement. Right? Those, those, were called, those were what the provinces were called, or opidum. But it's interesting to look at how the Roman camp was actually the model for the Roman city. You would have a series of administrative centers, a wall with gates on north, south, and east, west, and then a series of streets where the soldiers and the different sort of groups of soldiers, including where you would eat versus where you would sleep and uh, get ready for the next day's battle, was organized into a mini city. But they were very flexible in the way they could use this model. In fact, the way that uh, Julius Caesar conquered the, Gaul, the, Gaul, the, the Gauls, the Gauls were actually just like the Etruscans and, and the Greeks. They were settled up on, up on a hilltop near the hill, they protected hilltop. But Julius Caesar created a wall around their encampment so that he could isolate them and starve them out, right? Get them weak enough where they could just walk in and conquer them without any, too much of a fight. And they also protected themselves by creating a second wall. And the Romans would occupy the second wall, fighting any intruders who were trying to take them off with their guard towers and gates along the edges, and isolating the Gauls, uh, starving them to death on the inside. That's pretty although it's very cruel, it's pretty intelligent how to organize this very simple system of organization. Now, remember, the Romans did that and, and established the city of Florence. The city of Florence was based around this Roman encampment of Julius Caesar. Up on the hill, way up in Fiesole, was where the Etruscan city was up on the mountain. And they used a similar system 
to uh, take over the, the uh, Fiesel or the Etruscan, uh, the Etruscan city. Another important aspect of this kind of urban development around the Roman camp, so we see the Roman, the typical Roman city, and it's out and we see the piazza and the public buildings at the center and the north, south, east, west orientation of the major streets and the plots of land is this also development of the land outside of the city, this striga system, this centuriated landscape which puts the city at the center and allows then every square inch of the landscape to not only be plotted and organized and measured, but also to be taxed and recorded, right? So the Romans have a very systematic, repetitive, pervasive, simple system for organizing from the center to the edge to conquer and control and administer all of the land. So we see this relationship with this, between this administrative and military system into a kind of urban landscape and cultural spatial and uh, land serving and control system. Okay, let's see, how much time do we have left? We're almost done? Okay, so why don't we just stop there, give you a breather, and next week we'll start and talk about the Roman Empire and building times. Thanks very much. Thank you.